it works. Asia Pacific Coconut Community is an intergovernment organization made up of 18 member countries. It is uh, established uh, since 1969 under the UN ASCAP, United Nations Economic Social Commission, under the articles of uh, uh, United Nations uh, General Secretary approval in 1968. Philippines was a founding uh, member of APCC, in fact, the founding father, the very first executive director of APCC was a Filipino. The last one, I, my predecessor was also a Philippines man. They're two very good people. In the, nine, in the 18 countries, nine are from the Pacific, seven from Asia. Uh, we have associate members from Kenya and Jamaica now. At the last uh, ministerial meeting in Jakarta, last May only, uh, there was a resolution to graduate APCC to an international coconut community to take effect in three years' time in 2019 when the current APCC turns 50 years uh, old. Coconut is actually grown in about 90 countries. It doesn't mean that all the 90 countries produce copra and make, commercial, uh, make it commercial in the daily lives of farmers. And um, it accounts for, you know, just normal statistics. It accounts for over 70 billion nuts a year just from copra uh, equivalent figures uh, based on the hectares. Uh, uh, estimated at over 12 million hectares of under coconut. I'd like to get to the, I just want to show some graphs because it's easy for me to speak to them. This is the production trend uh, for coconut in let, let's say the 10 years. As you can see, there's not much fluctuation in either big drops or big increases in production. The darker green is the APCC member countries. The 18 countries produced uh, over nearly 80, 90 percent of the coconut production in the world. The remaining uh, lighter green down the bottom is mostly Mexico and Brazil, who are also fairly large producers in Latin America. Just to bring your attention to this graph, that because there is not much fluctuation. It means that there's not been a lot of new plantings of coconut. There's not been a lot of replanting of senile palms so that you do not see any change in production. We are worried because we think this might begin to drop if we don't start planting new coconuts. This is just a summary of the scenario for ABCC member countries. Uh, very important to actually look at this. You probably only need this one chart to talk about <laughs> the coconut industry. I, I like the first column because that humanizes the coconut industry. A lot of statistics talk about tonnages, uh, volumes, and, and, uh, and amounts. Not a lot of them talk about the number of households that entirely depend on coconut. Um, and so, you have 12 million families in India, for example, that depend entirely on coconut. And that's possibly 10% uh, 10, 10 of India population. You have uh, six and a half million households in Indonesia entirely dependent on coconut. Multiply by five members in the family, there's probably 20% of Indonesian population. Philippines, there was some debate on the figure, you know, 3.5 million or 4 million farmers. So we don't know when the last census was held. Uh, it is a very important number to know because if these families are dependent on coconut, they must have be living on land that coconut can grow and the coconut must be in different stages of uh, development, whether it's senile, whether it's new planting, whether it's uh, in Indonesia, a lot of waterlogged areas, so a lot of hectares, but not sufficient production. And so if we empower these people, we will have a, a revolution in coconut industry. The last column I, 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 I just want to discuss a little bit is the uh, productivity issues in terms of nuts per hectare. Those are just... Uh, 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 figures that APCC puts together from 
statistics given to us by the member countries uh, of ABCC. Uh, the not per hectare. Uh, India is double or more than double most of the countries. Uh, and a lot of people ask why. Uh, we have to find that out. Uh, I also find out a lot of the Indian coconuts are uh, quite small. <laughs> yeah? And they say the Philippines have the biggest nuts, I mean coconuts. Um, so uh, most of the countries are below 7,000, 6,000. Some struggle at 2,000, uh, 3,000 nuts per hectare. Because I think a lot of the coconuts are going senile. After 60 years, a palm will begin to decline in, in yield and productivity. After 100 years, we transfer that to the forestry department for timber. You know, when, a, when, when in Fiji, you cannot chop down a coconut tree until it stops bearing, because now it is timber. We were talking about coconut oil today, I think in some of the talks, uh, crude coconut oil from copra is still your largest uh, product of coconut traded globally at the moment. You do have the emerging high value products coming, but not overtaken that volume and quantity of, of production at the moment. Yeah. And Philippines obviously is, uh, as rightfully said by Madam Secretary, Under Secretary this morning, is your leading uh, producer of coconut oil. At the moment, it's, uh, the Rotterdam CIF price is uh, on 1100 US dollars, and it's staying on that level at the moment. Oops. Let me go easy on this thing. That's a 2014-2015 a uh, price behavior on coconut oil. Uh, there was a slow, slight slump. It was OK. I think everybody remembers 2014. Copper prices were pretty good. and. But I think Philippines still paying fairly good price for copra. Uh, at, uh, I'm not sure, 30 pesos at the moment. Sri Lanka is also paying a uh, good price for copra at the moment as well. If you look at coconut versus the other vegetable oils, um, our sister organization, our sister oil that came after coconut, is now 36% alongside soybean. The palm kernel oil, which is the only other lauric oil, against, uh, apart from coconut, that only two oils have lauric acid content. And PKO, or palm kernel oil, is still double in production in volumes to coconut oil. Uh, coconut oil is 1.7% and 3.6% uh, um, uh, palm kernel oil. Yeah, uh, that's just a table uh, showing the figures. But an interesting point is that even though vegetable oils in total, as a total, has increased every year by 15%, there's no increase in coconut oil. It remains stagnant. I just, just thought it would be good to show the behavior between the two comparisons between the two lauric oils, palm kernel oil and coconut oil prices. They're almost exactly the same. They run together, though coconut oil will enjoy a bit of premium from time to time. Yeah. I borrowed this from the Oleo Chemical Association in the Philippines. Just for those who may not be, who may be, may be new to the coconut industry, the oleo chemical industry is still the biggest takers of coconut oil at the moment. Uh, in China, in, in Japan, in different places, in Europe as well. This is the interesting part, and this is where the um, the change begins to take place now over the last five to seven years when you begin to get the um, emergence of the higher value products of coconut. Uh, this is a Philippine chart. 
Uh, it's an old one. Uh, and it still makes a lot of sense. You can talk about the coconut industry from just one chart. But it's important for farmers and young processors that are coming up. And there's a lot of young men and women younger that are coming into the industry. The, the coconut sugar manufacturers in India are young people, not, not old people. And they need to interpret charts like this to find their opportunities. If somebody, I went to Indonesia in, 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 in Sumatra, I saw a young man building and buying new visio, and I said, why are you doing this? He said, nobody else is doing it here. That's finding an opportunity in the, in the supply chain, to be able to do something nobody else is doing, because, and then making sure it is marketable, making sure it's profitable, and you know, going into it. The more of this that can happen, this is good news for the farmer because you can still sell your coconut. Desiccated coconut is probably your very well established uh, product because it's been around since the 60s. A, a lot of improvement has been in technologies in terms of equipment, in terms of making sure the cost effectiveness and the viability of the processes to make sure they can deliver a product for a profit, profitable price keeping the buyer happy and the processor in business. This is the price trend. There was a little bit of a slump uh, towards the end of 2015. We think in 2016 it's picked up and gone through. For any businessman, if there was a product you'd like to do, is DC. <laughs> it doesn't jump up and down too much. Yeah, you can invest long term. We come to virgin oil, this is your fastest growing uh, high value product for, for, for the niche market right now. There are issues with markets in some places, I think there, there could be issues with the Japanese market, there could be uh, I think too much stock there, there are probably 47 brands on the, on the Japanese market. Uh, and we, we are hoping that through the um, efforts of the private industry and the, and the sector and the people out there that are trading and marketing this product, that uh, they will also communicate back to the stakeholders if, they say, if there is a quality issue, if there is an issue with uh, packaging so that we can improve on what we are doing to keep that market open. It's very, very important for the coconut farmers. Obviously, the uh, the VCO prices continue to remain uh, not uh, about 4,500 to 5,000 US dollars per metric ton. This is a chart for Philippines for the last 10 years. All right, in 2001 to 2015. <laughs> well, 15 years. <laughs> and you can see what's happened with VCO. And it's not stopping there. The Philippine VCO export is increasing 20% each year. India has just started, I read in the Indian Coconut Journal, they just, they were late coming into virgin oil production. They're increasing export by 400% a month. So it just gives you some indication of where virgin oil is going. A, a number of Pacific countries have made, governments have made policies to stop making copra <laughs> and go to other high value products of coconut. There, it's government policy in Fiji now and some other places. Just some interesting products coming up in, this is a, a, a Johor product in Malaysia. Uh, down the bottom, the little, uh, those are uh, rollerball perfumes, uh, VCO with uh, Dior, maybe Boss. <laughs> And uh, because it's VCO based, you, you just put one on your chest and it stays there for the whole day. Yeah. Um, some, some packaging advancements to make sure that they meet the demands of the, of the international market. Um, coconut water was mentioned also today uh, amongst the leaders' uh, speeches here. This is the uh, fastest growing on the beverage market at the moment. I was with Tetra Pak in Singapore just about three weeks ago. They themselves cannot believe the way coconut water is actually moving. 
And to think, I think Philippines sends uh, water from the mature coconut to the United States. And I think when I was talking with Dr. Ponce Badugal, who was probably here today, he said, wait till they find out that the young coconut tastes better. <laughs> The U.S. market alone, which is supplied mostly out of Brazil, over three to 350 to 400 million U.S. dollars per annum market. And these are the, um, uh, yet not all coconut water pack packages will taste the same. Yeah, one factory I went to in India, they harvest uh, coconut at four months old because the customer doesn't want it to be too sweet. You go to the other market, the it's, if it's it, the other consumer, if it's not sweet, it's not coconut water. So you have differing uh, consumer needs and, and out there where maybe the processors can go to the extent of uh, investing well in the equipment in the processes so that they can meet that market demand. This is the trend of the coconut water exports. Uh, Mostly for Asia Pacific, it's mostly out of the Philippines. There's a lot of Indonesian uh, products coming on now. Not, well, not a lot, but quite a number coming on as well, and most uh, using Tetra Pak. So far, Brazil's the only uh, country leading by far. Caro Coco, the brand Caro Coco, the Vita Coco, a lot of that has a very big. Uh, 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 influence now into the market, yeah. In Indonesia, I think, uh, I don't know who has been to the big tree farm uh, for hydration, hydro cocoa, obviously this is, this is uh, reduced to powder now, you can just mix it with water. Uh, I just put it up because you must also look at the uh, nutritional facts on it because it is the health benefits and nutritional benefits of coconut water and VCO that's going to actually pull that market and drive it, as well as the performance of our private sector people out there, the marketing people, and the processors. The onuses will be upon them to make sure they maintain very high quality standards to, to meet the demands that are out there. Coconut flour is mostly Philippines, but uh, at the moment, it is processed from the residue of VCO production. Uh, same consistency as wheat flour. So maybe if we are not wheat growers in the Philippines, let's eat coconut flour. <laughs> coconut milk and coconut cream have been going on for quite a long time. But it's, it's suddenly now, you know, the, uh, instead of a lot of people consuming coconut milk, by cooking food and rice, you can actually now pour it into your cup of coffee. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that, you see? Yeah. yeah. I have a clip that was done by uh, So Delicious Dairy Products in America five years ago. And uh, they struggled as a non-dairy product company until they put coconut uh, milk into their lines of product. Maybe I'll just use a few seconds if I can just run the clipping for, for us. Of, of how they're pushing to uh, industries, uh, uh, the market out there is aggressively pushing coconut uh, product. Because it's important for Americans to convince Americans to consume coconut products. It's important for Germans to convince Germans to, con uh, to con consume coconut products. But the, the onus is on the sector and the stakeholders of the sector to make sure we maintain the highest quality standards possible to be able to keep the markets open. Uh, palm sugar, I think uh, Indonesia probably your largest coconut sugar uh, producer at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, produced by families in their, in their backyard kitchen. I think, uh, yeah, I, I just got some pictures of Indonesia. I, I visited this family because I bought this particular product in one of the leading supermarket chains, Care4, in, in Jakarta. And I decided that I'll take one weekend off and go and find out where it came from. And it was just a couple, and their niece and their nephew. 
<laughs> and it's just produced in the, in the, in the, in the back there. She, she has 400 coconuts uh, in the yard and harvest is uh, sap from the dwarf coconuts here. Another family in, in Lampung, uh, all they do is make that. The buyer comes around in the afternoon, the same day, and, and, and buys it off them. This is the uh, increasing uh, levels of production for coconut sugar now. This is using Indonesia. It's probably happening now in the Philippines. It will happen in India shortly as well. Just sharing words of wisdom from a, a great man did uh, 70 years ago that said the nectar from the coconut blossom is a way to solve the world's poverty and is an antidote against misery in 1939. Only three years ago, India started to harvest nira after repealing a 100-year law set by the British government not to Harvest Nira. The vision and the wisdom was provided 70 years ago and it took all those years. So an Indian family possibly has only 70 coconuts around their house. By harvesting Nira, they're able to make $40 per tree per month. On 40 trees, 1,600 US dollars a month, that's really good money. <laughs> Very good money for a family. You, you can be convinced after Coco Link this week that coconut industry is going to go into leaps and bounds in terms of uh, being an extremely viable industry. Um, because the coconuts are tall, they have to do uh, equipment to climb coconuts. Somebody saw this picture and says, uh, somebody I showed this picture to said, what a lucky coconut tree. <laughs> But uh, most of the technicians, most of the NIRA technicians are women. Unfortunately, in my country, in Papua New Guinea, uh, women are not allowed to climb trees. <laughs> I don't know why. I think they should. Coconut shell charcoal, activated carbon, similarly uh, moving fairly quickly. I was just going to show you and uh, the price trend in that as well. Uh, Depending on quality, Sri Lanka seems to be getting much higher prices at the moment for its uh, products. So if we're not getting that level of pricing, maybe we need to talk to the Sri Lankans to find out what they're actually doing to get that price. Yeah. The, in Indonesia, uh, farmers are taking the coconut ash to sell to the Koya factory. They're making their own charcoal and, and drying it around their houses and then taking it to the activated carbon plant. Usually the moisture is still about 30%, so the processor has to redry it back down to 20% before going into... They still use the traditional method of activated carbon uh, and, uh, and the modern method together. One factory did both. Yeah. I think Coir, the, on Thursday, will be a pretty good program on Coir products. India would be your leading country at the moment. Uh, in, over 200,000 tons of coir. Uh, I, uh, I think Philippines will be just be picking up, but uh, the process, processes are quite different. India soaks a lot of its coconut skin for a month or so, so that it's very, uh, you can almost do the fiber with your hands. Here, they, they have to do it through a machine to get it done fairly quickly. Okay, I think my time is running. I have to rush through this. Uh, a lot of the factories in Indonesia still uh, bale uh, raw fiber and into containers and, and, and sell them overseas. Um, this particular processor did not know, didn't want to have anything to do with the pith, which is quite a high value product. And so they were just clearing his yard and giving it to the person next door to process it. I just wanted to just share this before I close. We've just started the symposium on the health and nutrition benefits of coconut. Uh, and the last session has appointed an international advisory, scientific advisory committee, which is uh, actually chaired by a Filipino, uh, Dr. Toby Dairit, who is chairing the International Scientific Advisory Committee. 
this was the first symposium held in Delhi. It will be held old, held every two years. Uh, national studies have been completed on HIV against uh, VCO against HIV AIDS, VCO application for diabetes type 2. National studies have been completed in Indonesia. They now have to expand it to an international class 1 study by uh, expanding po population sample to multi-country, multi-ethnic grouping to be able to get that class of uh, scientific study. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if any lot of people remember uh, Professor John Kabara. I just share some of the words he mentioned here, that this was, we felt at the time that this was the turn of the uh, revolution in the coconut industry. When they found out that uh, the monolorins derived from coconut and palm kernel oil, uh, this is where the health benefits will drive the uh, market for the coconut products from here on, that we are moving away from being a sunset industry. I think I, a lot of people here would already know about uh, health benefits of coconut. May I just ask this morning with a show of hands, how many people in this room would be taking virgin coconut oil every morning, if you, if you don't mind? Okay, well, we need to convert another 70% <laughs> to VCO, yeah. Well, I'm nearly 60 and I still got dark hair, so I must be doing something right, yeah. I, I'm, I'm closing now, so I, I think my time is up. Uh, I just, uh, just uh, some recommendations. I, I have a report and a paper given to the uh, organizers here with uh, uh, recommendations are fully written out. It's very important for uh, Coco Link to hand this week with very strong recommendations that will go into all, also assist in guiding uh, policy, policy by government, policy by provincial governments or provincial uh, policy by national governments in terms of the industry. All right. That's very important. I, I, from APCC, we published 15 uh, quality standards. These are harmonized standards for coconut products. Uh, it's very important to maintain high quality standards. We have to aggressively pursue replanting and new planting programs. If we don't, at the moment, the statistics are showing that over the last 20, 30 years, there has been no new planting, not a lot at all. It's just starting. So if you haven't been planting for the last 20 years, as I say to the press today, that 20 years will come, 20 years time, we will see the impact of that. There could be a slump. In Thailand already, you cannot find coconuts. Uh, they, two, two companies alone I went to uh, in, in, in Thailand, they buy 100 million nuts a month together out of Western Indonesia. But those are the, uh, some of the recommendations I put in my report to the to Coco Link, if they can have a look at it. Uh, it's very important in number seven for policy support. And I think it was good to hear the Madam Secretary talk about that. Because there is, all, there is, there is still the government uh, community service responsibility to the farmer directly. That, uh, you know, PCA cannot do the processor cannot do, the market cannot do. And this is to help the desk to go down. So maybe Coco Link Conference can come up with some good recommendations at the end of this uh, time. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, my time's up, I'll, I'll hand here. I'm just gonna show you some of the publications APCC does. But uh, uh, we have Coco Tech Conference coming up in September, 26 to 30 in Bali. So if you wish to register, you can go on our website and uh, find out what to do there. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. I hope I've been of some help to you. God bless.